Okay, we're ready to start. We're, we're old-fashioned. We're using mics tonight. Can it, can you hear me, Dallas, back there? Uh, okay, so we're a little bit late, but we're okay. Um, let's take care of a couple things before we start. Uh, I've been asked to remind you guys, and I have these sheets. They're going to be up here. Um, do you remember last week when um, the pastor mentioned... Uh, uh, it's called Man Up, right? It's right here on your thing. There's a little QR code on the top. They need help in the back on Wednesday nights. And he has challenged the men to do that. I think Amanda told me they have one or two that have signed up. This starts next week. Uh, I think it's just a one-week commitment. Does somebody know something more than what I do about it? Anybody? No? Okay. So, guys, there's a need. Need some help. One Wednesday night, just go back there, keep the kids corralled, and help out where you need to help. Um, this is going to be on the table up front here. Um, I think you can scan the QR code on top on this man up and do the same thing. So tonight we need to, that needed to be announced. <clears throat> okay, everybody okay? Uh, I started to ask y'all to all move up because I have this problem as I get older, especially women that talk in the back, that frequency doesn't quite hit my ears anymore, but uh I know also that I live in a real world, and this is a Baptist church, and you guys don't move up when people ask you to, so I, I get that. I, I've been where you're at. I'm comfortable on the back. That's okay. So if I don't hear you tonight, I have Brady Miller that assures me he can hear everybody in the room. Uh, so ask your question. This is going to be a question and answer session, hopefully. Uh, what's required of you in a question and answer session? is to ask questions and to help give answers. So this is, this is not a lecture tonight. This is, uh, this is all of us discussing what, uh, what has been presented to us so far and trying to make some sense out of it and plug it into a timeline. And hopefully we're going to have fun doing that. I know this afternoon we met and we had loads of fun doing it in the back, just kind of running through it, Grant and uh, Brady and myself. So... Uh, Listen, um, last week, uh, does everybody know Steve Smith? Back? Steve, will you raise your hand? If, uh, if there's a prayer request that needs to be on the list, some, some need or, or uh, a burden, um, get with Steve. He wants to be able to include that and, and send that out to folks that can be praying about that during the week. We certainly want to hear that. Uh, Wednesday night's always been called prayer meeting and Bible study. That's what this is about. Uh, so if, if anybody has anything that they want to mention, now is the time. If not, if you don't want to, Steve, uh, Steve wants to compile those so we can uh, pray about that during the week. So is there anything on anybody's heart before we start? I feel like Elvis with this mic. Boom. Okay. Well, y'all pray for us that we don't mess this up. Uh, Steve Brodsky, will you will you lead us in prayer before we start, please? Oh, I didn't see you. I'm sorry. You raised your hand to volunteer to pray, or? Big bang. Okay. Okay. 
Do y'all, Ben's team won state again, didn't they, last week? Yeah. P- Paducah Tillman, he helps coach Paducah Tillman wrestling, and they, I guess they won big time, didn't they? Do you know, Steve? Right, right. Right. I, I just, I, I get my news off of Facebook, so I just seen him holding up a trophy. I don't know. I told him congratulations tonight, and he said thank you, so I figured I was right. <laughs> Ready? Thanks. Okay, a couple things to take care of and knock out before we start. Can everybody see this board? We tried to draw it real big. Um, two telephone numbers on there. Everybody has cell phones now. Um, if you don't want to ask your question out loud, I know there's some of you that don't like doing that. Uh, one of those is Dallas Pruitt's number. I have no idea which one it is. And one of them is uh, Alan Jones's. So we kind of tried to space it out. If you just want to, if you think of a question as we're going along and all of us are discussing, text it to one of them, and um, I'll, we'll be checking with them. They raise their hand, and they know when to ask the question. Your question will be asked. You don't have to sign it or anything like that. There's some cards in front of you. If you think of a question or a comment or something, maybe with anything, um, write it down on that. Uh, you can read it if you want to. Just interrupt me. I don't mind being interrupted or any of us. And you can ask it. uh, Or you can pass it up and we'll just read it. However you want to do that. Or you can just raise your hand and ignore the rest of it and just ask the question old-fashioned. So any way you want to do it's fine. Guys, we've been in this study for how long? This particular study. Uh, Anybody know? Five years. Woo, that's Alan Miller's watching this. <laughs> you said it. I didn't say it. You're out now. Yeah, you're out five years. 
<laughs> for, for a couple of months anyway, right? A couple, two, three months, Steve? Or a little bit. All right. Um, so what, we were, what we're going to try to do, I know it helped me. I did this last week. Uh, I sat down with the pastor, and it helped both of us, actually. We sat out there for, for a long while, and we got all the whiteboards out, and we, we, we just talked through a timeline. So all of these scriptures that he's, that he's put up, and we've worked our way through, we tried to plug that into a timeline and see how that fits, and try to see it from this perspective. Let me ask you guys a question, and I'm going to go ahead and be transparent, okay? I was raised traditional, fundamental, all that stuff, right? My dad, Southern Baptist pastor, I, I have not seen some of this stuff. I've never been challenged in the way that maybe the perspective or the viewpoint is of this. Understand that you guys do know that he's presenting this in a way just to consider it, just to say, hey, there's some opinions out there besides that traditional view. I don't think he said, hey, this is right and you have to believe. I, I don't think you're ever going to hear him say that. And that's not what we're saying tonight. But it's good to know how other people see it, to consider it, just stretch your mind, you know? And that's all we're doing tonight is trying to, trying to start a timeline. So here's what I have to ask of you guys. you got to help me, okay? Because we need to be on the same page as we work through this. Uh, are you going to do that first one? Uh, Grant said he's going to be our... He, you know, I don't have the scripture, but I'll try to remember them. You help me with the scripture. Okay, let's, let's rewind this thing as far back as it goes. Not in the study, but in history, Okay. When there was nothing else before creation, before the Bible even begins, what was there? Okay. Um, what is the proper name of God? Yahweh. So let's start right there. Yahweh is the first or the only uncaused cause, right? Uh, God in three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Correct? Okay. After that, I'm going to see where I want to go. Uh, after that, did, did God need to create anything? Was there a need in God? Was there, what am I looking for? Uh, a what? A what? There was a desire, yes. But there wasn't something missing out of the Godhead that he needed to create, is, was there? God is complete in who he is. Um, but for some reason, God decided to create. Why do you guys think that was? Why did God create? Bingo. For relationship. God is love. God was complete in the Godhead, but he chose to create to share his love and his relationship. That was a choice he made. So what was the first thing he created? Okay, I got that one. He said in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. Somebody else said something. I thought it was a woman's voice too. but Okay. Okay. Was that the first thing God created? That's Genesis 1 1. Is that the first thing God created? That's, that's John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word. All right. I want everybody to turn. It's going to take some flipping tonight. Flip to Job chapter 38. Do y'all remember what verses? I didn't, I don't have a, how much? Job 38, verses 4 through 7. Who's got a big voice in the back that can read forward? Mike, you got that? Can you read Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7?
All right. Wait, I'm, I'm just like Alan Miller. I'll stop you. Who's speaking right there? God. To who's he speaking to? Oh, absolutely. Right. Keep going. Who determines its basis? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line of harm? To what were its foundations fast? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When the morning stars did what? Sang together. Sang together, and somebody shouted for joy. Who was that? This is in heaven. These are divine beings. Angels, divine beings. At creation, Job 38 says, they shouted for joy as they witnessed it. So, I'll ask you the question again. What was the first thing that God created? Is this a, is this a new concept to you guys? Did God create angels first or the heavens and the earth? What are they saying? What are they saying, Alan Jones? Appears to be angels. Okay. So pre creation, what was our other verse? Well, did we have another verse in that? Psalm 89, 5 through 10. Is that pertinent? It was what? After what? Okay. Psalms 89, verses 5 through 10. Who's got that? Mike read that one. You got it? Yes. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty like you, Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds us. You rule the raging of the sea. When the waves rise, you still them. You have broken great by the people of one who is great. Verse 7 says, A God greatly feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all those who are around him. Um, it's just a, it's a support verse for Job 38 that shows you that God has chose to create somebody in heaven, angels, divine beings, to, to share in his love, in his family, in his relationship, in his sovereignty. So we call that pre-creation, that before the heavens and the earth, God created divine beings in heaven. Some of them are very familiar throughout the Bible. Gabriel, Michael, uh, somebody we call Lucifer. By, by the way, do, do you know something? I'm going to remind you what he said last week. Do you know Lucifer is only mentioned one time in the Bible? Do you know why we call him Lucifer? Because I've called him that all my life. That's a Latin word. Do you understand that Latin is not in the Bible? Latin got a hold of that and said, we call it Lucifer. It's actually uh, angel of light, right? Or day star. Is, is the morning star. Right. And so... So the root of that in Latin is lucid, to be, to be lucid like a lamp or, or, or light shining. That's where we get that. What do you got, J.R.? Can angels love? Can angels love? Like love. Grant, that's so easy of a question, I'm going to ask Grant to answer it. <laughs> mm-hmm.
So, without acting like I know the answer to that, uh, I think the love part, in my opinion, um, I think the love part comes, falls more in line when humans are created. Um, because we, love is a thing that has to be consensual. You know, it, it has to, you, I love you, you love me, kind of thing. That's relational. But God chose in pre-creation to, uh, to share in his sovereignty with a heavenly realm because they served him, they worship him, they carry out deeds for him, messenger angels, uh, warring angels. I think the love part falls more, does that make sense? More on humans where the sovereignty and participating in his sovereignty is more of an angelic or divine being kind of thing. I don't know whether angels can love. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. It's a good point. So, so what do you think? Answer your question. Can angels love? What do you say? You didn't know? Oh. Is that a hard no? Or just leaning? <laughs> yeah. What do what you got, Mr. Brodsky? And I'm glad you said that because that's going to play well as we pull this out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brady, that's your verse. Can you elaborate on the saints in Psalms 89? What verse was it? Nine? Five. Five. Uh, I, I, yeah. So mine says the holy ones. Yeah, mine says the holy ones too. Yeah, I think you. I think if you go back to the Hebrew on this, uh, it the scenes in heaven already at the first part of that, and so he's talking about the holy ones that are assembled there. Yeah, man. Question come in. So if angels can't love, does that mean that Lucifer slash demons can't hate? See what you started, Jr. See. <laughs> Move up here, Jr. to the front. Say, say, repeat that again. If angels, what? If angels can't love, does that mean Lucifer, Satan, slash demons can't hate? Hmm. Did y'all hear the question? If they can't love, then flip side of that coin, does that mean they can't hate? 
And we have an answer right here. Okay. All the way in the back. Wait a minute, Steve. We got another one. Well, Just. In the joke we read, it says that they were uh, praising his glory. Well, I don't know how you can have glory and not say that. Yeah. Okay, so what's the missing component there? Okay, so they are said there's a missing component. Well, being in creation, man is created in, in God's image. That, that's exactly where I was going to go. And our angels. Not that, that we see, correct? Not that we see. Not that we see. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Steve. Steve, Steve going to Revelation 12 right off the bat. We're in, we ain't even in Genesis yet, and he's already in Revelation. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, holy ones? I, I'd have to do a word study on it. I don't know. Oh, we're not calling on you. Are we sure that love has to be consensual? I think scripture leans towards loving those who first you hate. We, uh, what I was saying was we understand love as humans as, as, as given both ways. Now, can is it possible? Absolutely. It's possible to love without love coming back in return. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Andrea. I got about two thirds of that. Somebody apparently had a mic back there going, poo, 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 poo. <laughs> thought it was Brady, but it wasn't. Uh, did did y'all y'all hear what Andrea said? And, and I think what you're talking about when we get to the next part, we're going to see the we're, we're going to see that. Um, are we clear on this so far? So what did we learn from this timeline box one? There was nothing but him. The first thing he chose to do was create this because angels were there during creation Job 38 says that and the Bible says it it's got to be true right so they they cheered they celebrated at creation our creation so Genesis 1 1 John 1 1 um, we have creation so the next step pretty easy In the next box God creates what Paul, this is your. This is where you answered a minute ago. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. You all right? Here, I need to get my phone out to see where we went with this. What did Brady give you?
uh, we're on creation now. Um, we have established in Genesis 1 through Genesis 3 that God creates what? What else? There's a lot in between chapters 1 and 3. He creates a lot of things. Everything that we know to be real, right? Star, everything that we know. In the physical realm, he creates now. Before, he created in a spiritual realm. Angels, these Elohim that we've been talking about, uh, all this stuff that apparently was created before us. Now we're created and everything that we know to be true. The universe, the stars, people. Time. Did somebody say time? called the gap theory. Yeah. 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 There's value in it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else happened in Genesis chapter one through chapter three? God created, but what else, what else happens there? Let me ask you a question. So we'll expedite this thing. Um, Question for the room. Was Satan on earth between chapters 1 and chapter 3? I hear yes. Somebody tell me why. He tempted in chapter 3, so he was already here, right? Yes? So let me ask you another question, and we won't get bogged down in this, I promise. But it's just for thinking, okay? This is a valid question. Satan was cast out of God's presence, correct? Out of heaven, we always say. When did that happen? I'll tell you this. It's between Genesis 1 and 3. We don't have to look at the rest of the Bible to know that because he shows up in the garden as a deceiver, correct? So we know that his fall had to come before chapter 3, right? Now I'm asking you, when did that happen? Sometime, yeah. Yeah. We know. Yeah. Sure. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I put a beginning on it and I shouldn't have. Yeah. Sometime before chapter three. Have you guys thought about this? Is it important? It's, it's pretty good information to have, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. That's, that's commonly known as, and I don't like the label of gap theory, because when I was growing up, there was a Schofield Bible. God bless if you had one. I had two or three of them. And Schofield was a gap theory guy, and he plugged the dinosaurs into that. He plugged everything he couldn't explain into that, and that may be true. When I die, God might say, you know what, Schofield was right. Okay. Before four, okay. Before verse four, chapter four. Before chapter four. You want to elaborate or anything? So I mean, if it happened, so there's a theory out there that when the fall of man happened, the fall of Satan also happened. So if you account for that possibility, as small as that may be, then you have to include chapter three, correct? God is saying. Yes, absolutely. I'm just looking to see if everybody else is. Yeah, yeah. It's, so the idea of this is to, is to not say, okay, let's, let's go with what's always been said. Let's look at what other people are saying. Consider that. Not dismiss that because 
somebody else is saying it. So there is, did you guys catch what Grant was saying? There's a thought out there that, is it possible that who we know as Lucifer or Satan, the serpent in the garden, fell sometime in that same time period that we see mankind fall? I've never heard that. I've never even considered that until lately. Uh, it wasn't some guy I read or watched on the internet. It was, he's not in here, so I, I can say it. Um, it was somebody from this church that said, hey, have you ever considered that? I'm like, no, I haven't. Um, and as fantastic as it may sound, it, it kind of fits if you look at it a certain way. No, it's just, it just neat to look at. Information is good to have. Knowledge is good to have. So, yeah, I'm glad you said that. Uh, what, what else happened in Genesis chapter 1 through 3? We're, we're talking about the fall of Satan, but the fall of mankind happened also, right? But the serpent was already cunning and sly before the fall of man. That's a good point. And there you start comparing two opinions of when he fell, and you start giving credence to one. You see what I'm saying? And that's healthy. That's what we're supposed to do. What do you got, Mr. Jones? Do we know if Satan and the serpent are one in the same? Yeah. Do that Elvis you were doing earlier. Yeah. <laughs> So th there's the question. Uh, do we know that Satan and the serpent are one and the same? I've been taught that that is the same person. I've never heard any different. Steve, have you ever heard any different? I've never had any reason to believe any different. Uh, what do you guys think? You've sit in this study as long as I have. We've covered some of it, or he covered some of it. Let's blame it on Miller. He's not here, Right. Nakash. Nakash, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, serpent is correct, but are they one the same? We had a discussion today. I thought it was pretty interesting. What are the different names for Satan? We've kind of talked about this. So we talked about Lucifer, talked about Satan, talked about serpent. What else? Okay, great dragon, dragon of old. Morning star, day star, all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. What? Devil. Okay. Mm, that is a great question. Brady, <laughs> yeah, Brady, earn your money. <laughs> well, um, if you take it that Lucifer was a seraphim, um, seraphim literally means snake. It was a winged snake. So some believe that uh, the serpent in the garden was a spiritual being, but it was a winged serpent. And then whenever God cast him out of the garden, he cast him to his belly because he was at a hide and stay because he was flying. And really because he wanted to be above everything else, including Yahweh. So he got cursed to his belly lower. So he kind of flipped it. But that's only for those who think that um, he hadn't fallen, fallen before the garden. That's that view. If you're going to put him, that to answer... The question too, I'd say he, he fits. He fits pre-creation, spiritual. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure everybody's hearing that. Could it be that God sent one of His little G gods? That would be Elohim. the Elohim. Or Satan or the serpent purposefully to the garden. Um, okay. Oh. Y'all, can y'all hear her? Yeah. I can't. Why, yeah. why would God Answer. send her? 
Well, if God doesn't tempt, yeah, and okay. we'll get the purpose of that. Oh, well, I, no, 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 that's, that's it. Just yeah, yeah, what, yeah. He, what he's asking, I'm just trying to try to answer it in my opinion. I don't think that that would be possible because if he's implying that maybe what could tempt them to see how they would react without something to go, but God would. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt to me whenever you're in, let's place ourselves in Genesis 2 and 3 there. And there's no doubt, if they didn't seem like the serpent didn't belong. It wasn't like Eve went, what are you doing here? You don't belong. Or why are you talking? You know, that as you read the story, you don't, those things don't crop up. Eve's just going and talking to the serpent. So I, I think in that vein, you go, okay, for the people who say, well, maybe that's when the fall of Satan happened. Maybe you can track there because Satan belonged. But we don't know, honestly, right? right? I mean, mm. who's to say that that serpent was not a beautiful thing? Well, it, and, it lends itself, Nakash, to a winged dragon. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, you got to go to the Hebrew word there, Nakash, and yeah. Nakash can also mean dragon. So. Right. She did. We, Eve we, was not scared, was she? No, and here's no. the deal, too, Alan, with that. You know, I'm reading the kids' Bible uh, to my children. And you see Adam and Eve, and they're happy, and they're smiling, and here's this slithery little snake, just like we see it today. Well, what do we know in Genesis 3, 15, 16? It says what? You're going to be on your what? Your belly, right? So the, the children's Bible that we've all read to our children is wrong. Because it can't already be on its belly, and then God say, oh, now you're going to be on, its be on your belly. That makes no sense, correct? So it looked different than what we would assume if you went to the zoo or whatever and saw a snake. It had to have looked different. Is everybody tracking with me there? It had to have. In a, in a first century Jewish mind, they see a winged dragon, whatever size that is. Of course, we think of, I guess, Game of Thrones or dragons and and we think they're huge, um, and, and it very well could have been, but in a Jewish mind, they have no problem wrapping their mind around this, and if you think about what Grant said, the curse that was given to the serpent was opposite of what he was or what that serpent was when they came in. Apparently, they were higher up, now made to crawl on the belly in, in the dirt, so it was the opposite. Dallas. Is that, was that the spirit of that? Yeah, that's the spirit of that, I believe, based on what he asked, right? Mm -hmm. And I see it kind of as a parallel to God allowing Satan to meet the Gentiles to go. I mean, Job had a choice to turn his back on God. That's basically, what, that's basically what Satan wanted him to do. He said, if you do anything you want, you're just going to kill us. I'm going to take his life. Hey. To, me, I see, to me, I see that as a form of temptation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, in the beginning, you know, God said, here's all the things you can eat, right? And he gave them the option, here's all you can eat, here's what you can eat. So before Satan even came, or the serpent even came to talk to Eve, there was still a choice. So who's to say if Satan had never been there, that Adam and Eve wouldn't get their own, you know, I want to be higher than God, I'm going to eat of that. So just because Satan deceived them doesn't mean there wasn't a choice beforehand. So that may have already been a temptation. You know, they were already given a choice before they were deceived. And we do see in Job, didn't we read about a deceiving spirit? Wasn't that in Job? Am I right there? First Kings, First Kings yes. Thank you. Yep. My mind tracked there, too, to that story. Yeah. Whether or not the order it happened in, yeah. or did God 
So here's a question I've asked myself for months and months and months. I'm still looking for an answer. Maybe you can help me. I'm glad you said that, Pat. Yeah, exactly. Can love as we know it, can love exist without choice? Can you think of one instance? I'm not putting you on trial here. I've been trying to think of one instance where love can actually exist without choice. And I, maybe I'm ignorant, but I can't think of one. And I've asked a lot of people this question um, because I'm truly looking for that one instance where love, a real love exists without choice. I don't see anybody shaking their head, but when you go through all this, I'm so glad you guys went here. Because it's not really learning the mechanics of this. I like what you said, Pat. It's finding the heart of God, why he created, and what his plan is for it. Yes, he was sovereign. He knew that was going to happen. But without allowing even the spiritual beings a choice, love does not exist. Love cannot exist without a choice. Not as we know it. Um, yes, it would be easier if God just said, it seems like it in our finite mind, but, but this is the only way he could create love. And you know, the other thing, too, I'm not into the big study and the gap theory and all that, but I do know the Bible is not chronological. Right. Job is one of the earliest books, right? So we don't know how far up in the mm -hmm. Genesis. It's what? Job actually happened during Genesis. It it certainly seems like it, yeah. I had somebody tell me one time, Job happened before Genesis, and I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> uh, back to your first question, Pat. It uh, you know, some people kind of get, uh, I guess, discouraged when they're looking at the choice and why this why that but you know that really for me it heightens my love of God and it heightens his sense of love because he loved creation enough to create them with the choice and uh, the opportunity to be rejected This, the, of all things, this should build our opinion of his sovereignty. A God that can be sovereign over choice is amazing. To, to give us as humans and, and angelic beings or divine beings choice and him still be sovereign over all of that, I can't get my mind around it. God just continues to get bigger and bigger in my mind. Um, we, we've got about five minutes. Can we get to the next part? Um, great questions. Thank you. Great. These are questions I've asked myself. Um, those, those are good. So after creation, of course, we have the fall of man. Things go south, right? People start dying, not only physically but spiritually. Um, then we get to the big chapter about Genesis 6 that we spent so much time on. Uh, I think you reviewed on that for a few weeks. Uh, so, in brevity of time, can we, what happened in Genesis 6? Sorry? All right, yeah. Sons of God came down to the daughters of men. Now, there's about three views on this, and we, for five minutes, we can't do all of those views. He covered those views. Uh, how some people think these are the godly line of Seth. Some people think that these were just kings and rulers. Uh, some people think that these are angels. Sons of God came down to the daughters of men, and they gave birth to this unholy thing called a Nephilim. In Genesis 6, the Nephilim show up out of the unholy union between divine beings and women. I think we... we Kind of went with that strain. Is that the way he taught it? Now, here's the one that messed me up. 
I think it's Genesis 6 4. You got Genesis 6 4? I'm going to let you talk in the mic. I think it's just, is it Genesis 6 4 that we were focused on? You're not going to embarrass me, are you? No, just four, right? Just four, I think that's right. All right. The Nephilim were on the earth, and in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came and the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Okay. Here's, here's what's weird to me. Do you guys have trouble with this? The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And my wife was the first one to ask me that question. She said, how did they make it through the flood? There's about three or four theories of that out there, too. And at the end of the day, wherever you land on a theory, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter, but the Bible foundationally says that they were on the earth in those days and afterwards. No matter how you get them there, the Bible says they were there. Goliath was a Nephilim. Og, king of Bashan, was Nephilim. Joshua hunted Nephilim. David and the mighty men hunted Nephilim. They were on the earth after the flood. However we get them there, well, that's, that's up to you. Uh, there's a lot of good studies out there that you can spend weeks on. And Alan Miller covered a lot of this, of, of the theories of how they got there. But uh, we do see them before the flood and after the flood. And do you guys have anything that uh, we're going to have to close uh, we didn't get to the last two, but that's all right. Um, we have to do this next week also. So let's call this part A. You guys, uh, w we won't spend as much time setting up the phone numbers and all that next week, but this week, um, I know you probably took notes. Think about, you could get online and you can watch, you can watch previous Wednesday nights, and maybe some of these things that we've, you can see what he says beyond that, and um, man, I like the discussion, don't y'all? I, I really do, because I hear the same questions coming out of your minds that I have, that I've maybe worked through or I haven't, so hearing what you guys have to say on that, that's huge. Uh, this, is some, this is some stuff that you don't hear everywhere, isn't it? It is me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys got something to add? Uh, yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, this is really interesting stuff, and I'd label majority of this under non-essential, you know, things we can disagree on but still be on the same page. Um, but, you know, with Yahweh and his sovereignty and his heart, I believe that's essential, and that's really the motive behind it all. So we're not trying to be up here and just fascinate your brains with cool information. You know, one thing that's most important that I've seen throughout looking at this stuff isn't necessarily what I've actually learned, but it's as the Bible as a whole. So you see Yahweh's heart from Genesis to Revelation in ways that I've never seen before, in a ways that uh, really encourage me. So, you know, the heart of Jesus and Yahweh is behind what we're doing. It's not just to infatuate you. you good? It's good to think. Yeah, it's good to think. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say, Alan, too, if people have questions, additional questions, things they've been wrestling with, text me, text you, send them to Amanda, text, text Brady, text, text the people on the board, um, and we can chew through those this week and then present them next week. That'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, we're just throwing out ideas. We're not claiming any of this to, you know, that you have to accept it as truth, but we're wrestling with ideas and uh, we're presenting in a way that, you know, you can look at it because we don't want you to just take our word for it and that be it. Um, it means a lot more when you get into it for yourself, really. So we'll answer questions next week or we'll discuss questions. That's a better way to say it. Um, we're getting to a part that's, I'm going to be honest, I thought it was just a story in the Bible that really didn't have a lot of bearing on things until I started considering some of this perspective. And when you get to the Tower of Babel, 
You know, that's a story I was told in Bible school and Sunday school all my life, and I thought, well, they built a tower, and God didn't like it, and he made them scatter. Let's go on and read. And that's, there's not a lot of ink given to the Tower of Bible. Oh, but there really is. My question, I never did know why God did that. Uh, because God is God, and that's what he did, and I didn't question it. But there is a fascinating incredibly fascinating reason why God did that. And Tower of Babel has bearings on us even today. That's, it's, it's silly. I mean, it's, it's silly that I dismissed it for all those years. Did it not change it for you guys? So we will get into Tower of Babel next week, which he's already done. And um, anything's open to ask questions. So everybody good? I know it's time to go. We've got to get our little ones and get out of here. All mine's okay. No more questions. Uh, we'll be up here afterwards. We certainly don't have the answers, but we can wrestle with questions with you. Do what? If you want to stay another hour, you can just... Yeah, we don't want to stay another hour. Okay. Well, you guys have a good week. Have a good rest of your week. Have a good weekend. Uh, we'll see you later.